remember wanting so much to be part of a cause. I grew up in a generation that was told that we are the John Waynes and the, the heroes, the last vestige, the independent thinkers, you know, the baby boomers, the ones that were going to change the world, that yes, one person can make a difference. We were going to be the ones who, in our own pride and ego, was going to rebel against the government, you know, and we did. We dropped out. We dropped out of society. We dropped out of the government. We dropped out of schooling. We dropped out of everything as much as we could in those days and rebelled against what we saw as injustice in the world because we could see through what the government was doing and what other governments were doing and what America was all about. And we said those things even though 20, 30, 40 years later we are doing the same things that we said we were against. But at that time, we wanted a cause. We wanted to believe in something. So we switched over to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We looked for peace, love, and joy. We decided that we were hippies. And you know, the beatnik stage had migrated into kind of a rebellious attitude where all of a sudden, with drugs and rock and roll, we could change the world, or at least our perspective of it. So of course, a lot of people got into that. But for me, I always wanted to believe in something. I wanted to put my trust in my incredible intellect behind some cause that was righteous, that was right, that was, you know, dying for your faith or jumping on the grenade or doing something where, you know, you were like the hero. Because, you see, I believed in the idea and not the ideal. But the world that I lived in was very corrupt. And Everywhere that I looked, I could see that corruption. I could see that everything that everybody said was a lie. That everywhere that I challenged them on what they said they were doing, they didn't do. So whether it be a political system, historical, or any country in the world, as I began to explore them and as I began to know, I began to see how evil the world really was. And that discouraged me in a lot of ways because I recognized in high school, at a very young age, that everything was really about money. It was all corrupt. It could be manipulated by money. And sure enough, to this day, oh, I don't know, maybe 35, 40 years later, I haven't changed my opinion about it. Nothing had changed at all. The God of this world is about mammon, and mammon is the controlling influence of this world. Not just money, but the manipulation of man-made and man's idea and man himself, manifest destiny, so to speak. And mammon is manifest destiny in his personification of how it shows and reveals itself. But when I was at my worst moment in time of wanting to believe in something, God saved me. <laughs> Shock. Out of nowhere, I went to a concert and got saved. You know, I, I saw people that loved and were pure and holy and... It was, wow, just what I needed because I was very lonely inside. And so God filled up my loneliness. He took away my despair, my feelings of you know, anxiety and care and you know, all these other things and filled me with this love. And that was great. I had love and joy and peace. But you know, I still had a mind. I still had an intellect. I still had intelligence that I looked at the world not like other people. And I said, what's wrong with the world? And Jesus told me what was wrong with the world. And when I read it, I went, oh, I'm set free. This is the truth. Jesus said it. You know, love your enemies, you know, seek not the kingdom, seek not the world, you know, but take up your cross, follow him, you know, all those things. That this is not our home, this world is controlled by Satan, you know, and the manipulation of the principality powers and demons, spiritual wickedness, high places is happening in all the governments and God is in charge and that behind the scenes there's always these things going on and not just one person like people try to blame, but that there's something else that's going on even behind that. And so I kind of recognized, wow, so this is who I need to be. I need to follow Jesus. I need to be like him. And look at all these other people that are doing the same. And then I began to see how people in Christendom weren't. They began to change what they knew to what they wanted. And that broke my heart. And to this day, it still saddens me in a lot of ways because, you see, there is a part of Christianity that thinks violence is the means to an end. That somehow a Christian war can accomplish more for God 
that God himself doing it by way of using those evil empires that are in the world to manipulate over themselves and to cause them to destroy themselves. But you see, a lot of Christians don't accept that. They think they have to be involved. They want to be the one in charge. Sadly, that's not my God. And I have to walk away from that. And it really grieves me in a lot of ways, in some ways, that I get discouraged at certain times when I see everyone running out to buy a gun. Because they'll die by the gun. Yeah, they'll buy one, but sure enough, either them, their family member, or someone in their neighborhood or their sphere of influences will be killed by that gun. Guaranteed, 100%. They that live by the sword will die by the sword. They that live by the gun will die by the gun. You will cause the death of someone because of your gun. But you see, it's a right. Oh, so we have to exercise it. Because it's our right, we can do it. Really. It's my privilege to be a child of God. It's my inheritance to be a son of God. It's my choice to follow Jesus. I will not take up the gun in order to follow Jesus. And yet some people think that they have to be politically violent. You know, They have to protest and argue and debate and get into all these you know, gyrations and consternations and frustrations when they think that prayer is ineffective and God can't move or manipulate or do anything about it. Because after all, even though the king's heart is in his hands, we know that God won't do that for us if we pray. Will he? You see, the Christianity that a lot of people I deal with in everyday life now have an impotent God. And it breaks my heart because I know God. And I know how he feels about it. And it breaks his heart. The tragedy of seeing this effect of changing the image of the incorruptible God into the image of the corruptible man is that it makes God less than who he is. And you know something? I won't do that. Be perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. I am the Almighty God. Walk before me. Be thou perfect. You shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy and have severed you from other people that you should be mine. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify, your, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You were complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Search me, O God, and know my heart, Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The way that Jesus brought was called the way. It was something that was contrary to the entire world system and is still contrary to mankind today. It is the opposite of mammon. It is the opposite of what men will do. People say that there's this fight or flight and neither one is of God. still and know that I am God. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Watch and see what I will do. For that is a living God. You see, God has angels. God has power. God is not impotent. God is on the throne. God is doing things. God can at any moment, right now, even to this very second, just say, it's over. Bingo, it's done. That quick, that easy. That's why he's the almighty God and he's holy. And we need to walk before him humbly. Because as much as people want to manipulate God and think that they can because God is long-suffering and peaceful and right now he puts up with it, it's not about the strength of arm or arms. It's not about your weaponry or your ability. It's not about you, period, because you're supposed to deny yourself. It's always been about God and what he is doing and what he has done. Because if we're not telling the world about God himself and how real he is, 
then we're doing something contrary to the nature of what God is, which is revealing to us the truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is the way. The way that we see Jesus operating was never violent. People try to use this whole idea of somehow he went into the temple and cleared the temple because of zeal of the Father's house, you know, consumed him. That would be like me turning this table over. What would happen if the table turned over? The dog downstairs would start barking. You know, maybe some people would look around and be, you know, surprised. If I turned over a couple tables, guess what? That's not violence. That's not violent means. That's not killing someone. That's not justification for taking authority yourself and operating according to the murdering of another soul. Because while you may call it justifiable, homicide or whatever it may be, the murder of a soul is the destruction of the ability for that person to choose eternal life. And if we take that opportunity of choice out of someone's hands, are we playing God? You see, there's such a real determination about that that you need to be exactly sure that you want blood on your hands before you start taking up weaponry to do that. You need to know and understand that the first time you kill someone, that soul cries out to you. That blood cries out from the earth with your name on it. The question is, did God tell you to? And you need to ask that before you dare, before you even consider the violent man or the violent means, you need to look at violence in the Bible. See what Jesus had to say about the violent man and what the end times would be like and what the generation that is born unto this last day would be like. Violence, killing, murdering their parents, truth breakers, oath breakers, law breakers, inordinate affections, people that would be violent about everything except peace, love, and joy. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. Behold, thou desirest truth in your inward parts, and in the hidden part that thou shalt make known wisdom. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live so soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. In this present world, we should live soberly. We should live righteously. We should live godly. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Not as though I had already attained or either were already perfect. For every man that hath his hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God who also has given unto us the earnest of the Spirit for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edification of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure, the stature, the fullness of Jesus. If you think that somehow being politically active, socially conscious, worldly participation, and violently manipulated, you can do that and be in the full stature of Jesus, you're deceived. You need to stop what you're doing and have a hard, cold talk with Jesus. You need to recognize what he said and go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Read what it says. Just start there. That's all I ask. Start with the Sermon on the Mount and read it from beginning to end. And at the end of it, remember what he says. These people that do these things. And don't try to distort the words. Don't try to change them. For the sake of your peace and mine, for the sake of the unity of the body of brethren that you know we are the body of Christ and that soon Jesus is coming and we will not be here recognize very simply why you were created what you were created for and how God is going to end this world and then tell me why you need to do violently what you think you need to do because you're going to find not only is violence not the answer but as far as God is concerned it never has been.